I think the structure of the economics profession in uh, the academic world is uh, it's profoundly in need of reform. And I, I like to say it needs two things, glasnost and perestroika, openness and restructuring. Of course, when you apply those things, the chances are, like, like the Soviet Union, the whole edifice will collapse, which would, in this case, not be a bad thing. What do we have? We have a profession which is basically self-dealing uh, and which uh, runs the, the, the uh, let's say, the, the hierarchy of professional merit uh, through a structure of journals and so forth and, and, and departments which are profoundly tribal uh, and profoundly uh, restrictive in terms of what they, uh, what they will what they will publish, what they will admit as uh, a body of ideas. And so even when, as is happening, uh, you get in reaction to that independent scholars, uh, this has no impact on the willingness of the best funded and the most prestigious universities to take on board people from those traditions. And as a result, compared to what economics was 60, 70, 80 years ago, a very diverse group of people, what you have now is a, uh, is a machine that produces uh, a substantial uniformity of thought and which is stuck, cannot, cannot uh, really uh, bring itself to uh, adjust to the fact that that thought is not, is not particularly pertinent to the major problems that we face. I'm James Galbraith. I uh, teach at the LBJ School at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and I have been, I was for 20 years, the chair of the Board of Economists for Peace and Security. I work primarily on economic inequality uh, and a uh, uh, certain amount of intervention in matters of political economy. Well, the University of Texas Inequality Project is a uh, research group which has been in existence for now over 20 years with uh, cohorts basically of PhD and a few master students. Uh, and its objective has been to develop a new um, whole series of, of, of uh, measurements of economic inequality, mostly pay and income inequality, uh, at the global scale uh, and in a consistent and, and uh, let's say, dense way so that one can construct uh, reasonable and reasonably reliable time series uh, for the largest share of the world economy. Uh, it now has about, uh, in the single com largest global data set, uh, about 4,000 observations covering 150 countries going back to 1963. Uh, and so what it does is permits a, um, a, a researcher to, to take an entirely um, fresh uh, look at the movement of economic inequality across countries and through time. Uh, and that permits one to, to analyze the interrelationship between countries within continents, across continents, and to demonstrate, in effect, that there is a uh, strong macroeconomic component to the movement of inequality, that it's driven in very substantial ways by the changing uh, nature of the, of the global financial regime uh, and by, uh, you know, by such things as the breakdown of Bet Bretton Woods, the debt crisis in the 1980s, then the uh, reduction of interest rates and the commodity recovery of the, of the 2000s. These things appear to be very much the dominant forces in the movement of inequality, and that's quite a different perspective from what one gets out of uh, either the mainstream li literature or the very selective work that's been done on, on, based on tax records uh, by, by the famous Piketty team. The thesis of the end of normal uh, was that uh, one needed to move past the uh, methodological procedure of trying to project the future after a major event like the Great Crisis from the record of what was the past pattern of economic recoveries. And my argument was that there had been some fairly clear structural developments in the system. Uh, one of them had to do with the cost of resources, which of course we know the oil price went up to $148 a barrel in the summer before the crisis of 2008. Since then there's been the development of fracking, which is kind of a uh, a reprieve from uh, the very high energy prices. Uh, but that was one factor. The second factor was the instability of the global political situation. A third factor was the nature of technological change. And I, I really do believe that the kind of technology that we are uh, introducing practically everywhere and have been for several decades is 
different in its effect on uh, economic activity than the previous waves of technological development. The automobiles replaced the horses and brought, uh, brought activities like transportation, appliances brought activities like all kinds of things, cleaning and so forth, and cooking into the market sphere. Uh, the, the digital technologies would tend to move things out of the market sphere by making communications, for example, basically a fixed cost exercise, no marginal cost, no, contrib no extra contribution to the, uh, to the, uh, to the gross product. Uh, and so this is something we need to come to grips with because it reduces, among other things, the share of investment in GDP, the fact that investment comes from imported capital goods means that you get an import offset. Uh, and so we see a low share of investment, less need for commercial uh, uh, construction uh, to, to go with that kind of investment, uh, and a, an economy which is shifting to being driven uh, by consumption rather than by the cycle of investment, much what we've seen in the last, I think, 10 years, uh, strongly suggests that this was the correct analysis. And the fourth thing was this: what happened to the financial system. Uh, the, the banks, in my view, uh, were fundamentally broken uh, by the business models that they adopted and pursued in the run-up to the Great Crisis. They moved from what they had been doing in the post-war period, which was uh, substantially it, uh, uh, financing business investment, to financing uh, consumer loans and mortgages. Uh, and to doing so on an increasingly decrepit, fraudulent uh, um, business model, decrepit and fraudulent in the sense that they were, uh, in the run-up to the crisis, making vast uh, numbers of loans, vast volumes of loans, uh, that they knew or should have known would never be repaid. And this was a model which was destined not only to collapse, but also to deplete the equity, which was the foundation for uh, economic expansion up to that point. So when these things happen, it seems to me, we have to come to grips with the fact that the world going forward is not the same as the world that existed before. And a statistical projection uh, that says simply, oh, well, you just add to demand, you'll get a higher rate of output, a higher rate of potential output, isn't correct anymore, isn't a good way to analyze the, uh, uh, the, the, the world that we're now living in. Well, I think there is a, a crisis of economic ideas underlies the crisis of policy. Uh, and to c take this into another sphere, I mean, I was working uh, with Yanis Varoufakis in Greece in the Athens Spring of, of, of 2015, uh, and it was very clear that we were up against uh, a body of policy that was driven by profoundly dysfunctional uh, ideas, I mean, to the extent that they weren't actually malicious, which they were uh, to a degree. But the notion uh, that what was being offered to Greece uh, uh, was a recovery program, something which would restore the competitiveness of the Greek economy, was just profoundly out of sync with the reality that anybody on the ground could see. Uh, there was no, there's no question that in the world that presently exists, uh, the Greeks cannot attract German industry to Athens by cutting their wages, and they can't attract the Chinese industry either by cutting their wages. So they're stuck between these two poles of industrial development, and in order for a small country like Greece to prosper, it has to have investment of a different kind. It has to have uh, a strategy of a different kind, and it has to have the resources to pack that up. There was no recognition, no willingness even to confront this. Instead, what the economists of the IMF and the European Commission and the, especially the European Central Bank were advancing for Greece was a formula, that, exactly the same kind of formula that tried and failed in Indonesia, tried and failed in, in Korea and every place else where they run a program. Uh, and so uh, they, were, they, they, they were intent upon maintaining their ideas because they were invested in them, uh, not in adjusting to the realities of the situation, even though anybody who had a more let's say, reality-based view, including directors of the IMF, and uh, were, were clearly telling them that this was a, this was a program destined to fail. There's a, a, a remark I read the other day, if you're interested in new ideas, read old books. Go to the library, uh, pick out the things which are definitely not on your reading lists, and read them. That will get, will get you somewhere. I mean, you read, and I do this actually with my, my classes in Texas. I, I, we, have, I mean, we, we have Smith, Ricardo, Marx, but especially 
uh, Veblen, Schumpeter, Keynes, my father. Uh, and this gives the students a sense of just how economics was when it was a useful subject. Uh, it was a discipline that was invested in a kind of profound sense of, of, of criticism of the social and economic order, understanding through criticism of what, uh, what the problems were, and it prepared people, at least a few people, who were at least ready to be uh, useful when there were crises and you actually needed to have someone's expertise. Um, and that plus a certain amount of, uh, I think it is essential to have a certain amount of statistical and mathematical training to understand how you can deal with the kind of numbers that economic systems generate and to deal with them flexibly. And that also is a big deficiency, by the way, of the current education, because what do you get? You get a certain kind of algebra, which is intended to build equation systems that you can put in journal articles. And you get a certain kind of statistics, which is intended to deal with sample surveys, essentially. And that's what economists, particularly microeconomists, are considered to be the way of dealing, and now the new development economists with their randomized controlled trials. Uh, it's sort of, okay, if you have uh, statistically significant differences, you have an answer. Well, you know, in the real world, uh, in order to run a system, you need to have measures of how that system is performing. You need to be able to deal with the national income accounts, but also with the industrial accounts and the employment accounts and the other features of the system, and to be able to use that data in a constructive way. And to come back to the University of Texas Inequality Project, what we did, which was methodologically interesting, was to take up this vast neglected body of data which continues to be generated by public agencies all over the world, and to show that for the purpose of studying inequality, it was not only very useful, very reliable, but much cheaper and much more up to date than waiting, funding a, a survey and a vast survey and waiting for the results to come in. So we were able to, to find the decline in inequality in Latin America uh, as a result of the retreat from neoliberalism following 2000, well before anybody else. Uh, started publishing on that. We were able to identify the turning points in China years before the surveys showed that they were there. And it was just using the data that the Chinese were publishing on a regular day basis that the Latin American countries were. So, you know, there is a sense in which uh, a certain kind of technical training which has been on the fringe could be very useful uh, for a larger number of people, and you get a lot more useful research out of it if you, if you proceed it along those lines. I'm, I've not spent a lot of my time uh, in attempts to reform what I consider to be essentially unreformable, the economics profession. I've got my appointment in a, in a, in a public policy school, thank you very much. Uh, and what I think is necessary from that standpoint is for universities to create smaller autonomous units not necessarily policy schools, but you could have a Department of Social Economics, a Department of Political Economics, this kind of thing, that were, aut that were autonomous uh, and that were not dependent on the same narrow hierarchy of promotion. So then you'd have a, begin to have a diversity of views. You'd begin to have what some economists consider to be the sign of a healthy system, namely it's called competition, something which is manifestly absent inside the economics profession these days.